do a more steady state. When we talked about moving into the steady state response, our vaccine administration will continue. So that's an important component here. Governor Cox and I are very unified in our desire to get vaccines to as many people as possible. This is an effort that we have undertaken since the very beginning of our administration, and we will continue to do so. That will include vaccinations for children younger than five as soon as they're authorized. And we've already made great strides in preparing for this. 79% of the state's healthcare providers who, um, who participate in Vaccines for Children program are also now enrolled to administer COVID vaccines. These providers will be critical when it comes to uh, time to vaccinate children under the age of five years old. And we will continue to work with the remaining 21% of these providers to convince them to offer COVID vaccines to their patients as well. Vaccines have saved a lot of lives and they prevented so much spread since they were introduced just over a year ago. Some people may take issue uh, with this because they were fully vaccinated and still got sick. Um, I was one of those who was fully vaccinated and still got sick. Um, but I also understand that uh, vaccines ensured that while my illness the second time um, kept me home for a couple of weeks and, and, and was difficult, it also kept me out of the hospital. And I didn't, uh, as you can see, I'm not on oxygen this time as I was for several months after the first, um, my first bout of COVID in 2020. Uh, we're trying to help you understand that we're dealing with probabilities here. You're more likely to be protected from severe disease if you are vaccinated. Please remember that during the last two surges, hospitals were not filling up with vaccinated people. It was unvaccinated people who accounted for the vast majority of hospitalizations and ICU admissions. Now, as far as boosters go, we still have a long way to go to make sure that people are adequately protected. Data show that people who are boosted have significantly more protection than someone who has no protection or has just their initial COVID immunizations. And as we've noted many times, um, these tools that we have at our disposal don't work if they're not used. So we will continue to be ready to adjust and, and respond uh, to the needs uh, as, as cases may go up and down, but we are also making sure uh, that their uh, boosters and vaccines are available to people. We have a lot to be proud of over the last year. In just a year and two months, we've administered 4.9 million doses of vaccine. 68.7% of all Utahns have received at least one dose of vaccine. We're especially proud of vaccinations that have happened among our multi multicultural communities. If you remember, we uh, have been focused on making sure that there is an equitable distribution of vaccines into our diver diverse communities. And as of yesterday, 80.4% of eligible Asians have received at least one dose of the vaccine. 64% of eligible Hispanics have received it, at least one dose. 75% of eligible Blacks, 71% of eligible Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, 80% of eligible American Indian and Alaska Natives, and 71% of the eligible white population have received at least one dose of the vaccine. Now, vaccines have served us very well and will continue to do so, um, not only to limit the disease, but also to reduce uh, severe outcomes, um, limit mutations of the virus and into, into new variants and, uh, and limit the amount of people who need to be hospitalized um, or, or pass away from this. So uh, we just need to use them and we encourage everybody to continue to get vaccinated and boosted as they're eligible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor, <coughs> Lieutenant Governor. I have the opportunity to talk to you today in more detail about what we're thinking related to our testing processes, uh, related to healthcare, and also related to our treatments. In particular, related to testing, we uh, had planning related to this and how we wanted to move forward in this process. As we look at the steady state and how we want to have testing as we move into the steady state, we're, we're going to be relying primi primarily on our healthcare systems. So you think about the other types of testing you traditionally get, that you would be getting those from your doctor's office, your urgent care sites. 
this is where COVID testing will be going and this is where it will be happening once we move to this steady state. We also have other types of testing that maybe is very specialized, uh, travel testing and some of those areas or event testing. Those will be moving to private providers. The state will no longer be playing that role in the steady state model, that that would be something that the State Department of Health would be uh, providing or uh, supporting through contracts. Also, as the governor mentioned, uh, at-home testing is now much more readily available. And so if individuals have a desire to test themselves uh, for whatever reason, they have the ability to get those through uh, their pharmacies or uh, uh, grocery stores or other locations. Uh, there's a federal program that provides those tests uh, to individuals where you can requ request those and send four of those to your house. Uh, also, health insurance companies also pay for those uh, for privately insured individuals. So there's a lot of different options uh, for members of our community to get this at-home testing. Public health will still have a role in this testing. There are, so, as always, we are working to help support uh, underserved populations and we'll continue to find ways to do that, uh, both through at-home testing and we'll be looking at other models where we can support that. There are certain communities that are at higher risk. Um, we'll continue to help in those areas with long-term care facilities, other congregate facilities like correction facilities. We'll continue to work in those areas. And also uh, if outbreaks uh, do arise, uh, that's an area that we will still expect that the state uh, Department of Health will still be stepping in to try to help address those, provide additional testing and support those. This transition's already begun. Uh, as we brought in uh, through the Omicron surge, there was a significant amount of testing that was up and available. Uh, and some of those that were brought in was related to the CDC. They brought in two additional sites for us at the University of Utah and at Utah Valley. Uh, both of those sites will be closing, uh, and that was part of what was planned when they came. They came to help with the surge. The surge was passed, and those were planning to, to ramp down. In addition, as we work with our contracted testing partners, we'll also be closing sites uh, at BYU, at the Maverick Center, Bluffdale, Layton, and Hiram sites. Uh, this is part of our planned uh, rollback as we have less demand. If you've been by our sites recently, uh, they, they, they haven't had the lines that we saw a month ago. And so we're, this is part of our ramp down to move towards a more steady state. And it's part of what we'll be doing as we go forward. We'll continue to look at sites. We're still looking to make sure that we have geographic coverage through this ramp down period, but we will be reducing the number of sites we have because there's just simply not the demand right now to require those sites. In addition, uh, as we talk about who should be uh, coming to get testing, we had some discussions about that last month. Uh, there's groups that we would continue to recommend get testing, uh, people who would benefit from treatment and need that positive test result. Uh, so we would still encourage them to get tested. Older individuals uh, that are still have high risk conditions, we would still uh, recommend that they get tested. Vulnerable populations uh, and those who work with them. So again, like the healthcare settings, long-term care facilities, uh, congregate living or correction facilities, we would still recommend that they get tested. And people who visit vulnerable individuals, we would also recommend that if that's, uh, as, as you're making those visits, if you would feel more comfortable doing that, that you go get tested too uh, before you do that. Uh, as we ramp down and as we move into the steady state, the state is not stepping completely back from this. Uh, we will be prepared if needed to ramp back up. Uh, as we've seen over the last two years, uh, there's been pauses or um, quiet periods uh, in the numbers of infections but we will be ready to move back in if, if needed. We will retain a core staff uh, that will be ready to do testing from the State Department of Health uh, and we'll, we'll have that in place. Uh, we're also going to maintain our contracts with our contracted vendors. Uh, so if needed, we can come back and ask them to come back online and be able to help us in that process. We are, have been establishing a model that we call a kiosk model, which is a lighter staffed version of testing modeled after some work that Intermountain did and was uh, and also the University of Utah have been doing in this area uh, where it's much light more lightly staffed individuals can get a collection kit do the collection on their own uh, and then be able to return that kit so we're also looking at that as a model uh, how we might stay engaged and be able to ramp back up quickly if needed uh, and we'll also make sure make sure that we retain adequate supplies in our warehouse uh, so that if these ramp ups need to occur quickly that we have those available uh, lastly, I will just talk about healthcare, healthcare and the treatments uh, that are, have been provided through healthcare. We have been supporting the hospitals uh, with contracts that allow individuals that need to leave hospitals to be able to move into long-term care facilities, into COVID positive facilities. Uh, we'll be ramping down those contracts as, as the numbers in hospitals are finally beginning to move down more recently. 
Uh, but again, we'll retain those contracts in place to be able to use as a ramp up. In addition, related to treatments, the state has, uh, with the press that was on hospitals, the state stepped in and began providing some of these treatments for uh, COVID-19. Again, we'll be moving those back to the healthcare systems uh, and that they now have the ability as these medicines become more widely available and actually as demand has been dropping for them, uh, their ability to be able to provide the antivirals and the monoclonal antibodies will be uh, more adequately matched uh, to their ability to do that. So with that, uh, I'll turn the time over to Dr. Nolan to talk a little bit about how we're looking at data related to this ramp up, ramp down and steady state. Thank you. Thank you. So now you've heard how we're going forward into this study state regarding vaccines, how we're going forward in terms of uh, testing, how we're going forward in terms of treatment. But in addition, we have to go forward uh, thinking about how we're thinking about cases and how we're following this whole, these infections um, as we get to the steady state. And I think it's important for all of us to reset our mind about how we're gonna look at things as we go forward because things are changing. Um, not only are cases going down, but how we're capturing cases has really changed. And so we need to look at it in a different way. So going forward, we expect we will decrease the amount of times we'll talk to you as the public, as the press about these cases. We'll probably be reporting more on a weekly basis about what kind of cases are occurring, who's in the hospital, who's died. And we'll be changing our websites to really highlight more the trends instead of the day-to-day -day, uh, individual cases. And that's because that is the, uh, the need we need as we go into a steady state. We should be thinking as a term, long-term, and a trend instead of every day at one point. But I can say at the Department of Health, we still have good capacity to be able to understand what is happening. We have wastewater surveillance that is really working really well in our state where we can see our cases having more, case, more people shedding the virus or are they having less, meaning there's more or less spread. So we can look at that. We can look at emergency room visits and clinic visits to see who's going in for care. And that can tell us if things getting worse, are they getting better? And we also have that ultimate, um, indicators, hospitalizations, and deaths, and we will continue to follow those really closely. So while I say we're not going to look really at cases every day, we're going to continue to have a really good idea of what's happening in the state so we can understand where we are and what we need to adjust. And also the other thing that's really important is we at the Department of Health are going to keep an eye on what's coming next. Um, we all know there's a possibility that there's new variants coming, and we need to be ready for that. So we have good systems in place to look. We have an excellent system here at, in Utah that looks at whole genome sequencing of the virus, which allows us to know what is the new virus circulating in our state? Is something new coming in? And of course, we're gonna be keeping watch of what's happening around the world and really keeping an eye on how uh, different variants are impacting other countries, other states, so that we know what might be coming towards us so that we are ready. So I think throughout um, this next year, years, we're gonna be keeping an eye on everything, making sure we can respond, we can ramp back up from that steady state if we need to. But for now, we're gonna be moving forward with this longer term trend analysis and approaching things instead of on a day-to-day -day basis, more on a overall uh, pattern. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nolan, uh, for, for that. Um, I, I know this is, a, again, this is a, a definite change for, for all of us. Uh, the, the case count piece, we, we've all kind of become addicted to the case counts every day, and uh, that will be changing. I don't know what, uh, what Ben Winslow or Robert Gerke are going to tweet about every day, but that, that will be changing as, as well. Um, we, uh, as, as was mentioned by, by both of them, I think it's important to note that again, we, we have to be able to ramp down and that's what we're doing. And I, I want to just reemphasize this is, we're, we're trending towards March 31st, the end of March. So this is a, a six week uh, ramp down, um, but, but also that we have the ability to ramp up very quickly as we're stockpiling supplies so that, and with our surveillance, we'll be able to see what's happening here in the state of Utah, but also what's happening across the globe. What we saw with Omicron, we, we found out from South Africa what was going to happen. Um, Omicron ended up being the most predictable of all the variants. It, it acted the very same in, in every country, in, in, in every state. And, uh, and so we'll be able to see that, whether it's happening here at home or somewhere else, and be able to respond quickly and, uh, and accordingly. And the last thing I, I just want to say is, is this, that as we transition into this idea of, of a manageable risk model, a steady state, um, a, a personal risk and responsibility model, 
we, uh, we have to be okay with the decisions that we make, every, every single one of us. You'll notice today that there are several people in this room that are wearing masks. That's okay. There are also people in this room who have chosen not to wear masks. That is also okay. And we all need to be okay with those personal decisions that people are making. I do think that, uh, th that hopefully there are some positive things that will come out of this. And that is, if, if you are sick for, for any reason, uh, whether it's COVID or the flu or just a cold, if you can, please stay home. That's just common courtesy. Uh, we, we, we don't all want to have your cold or your Omicron or whatever it is that you have. So if you can't stay home, do. If you can't stay home, um, please consider wearing a mask. If you're ill, if you're sick around your colleagues, it's, again, just a, just a sign of, 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 of professional responsibility, common courtesy, and, and kindness to be able to do that, to, to not spread whatever it is that we're sick with. So I hope that that is something positive that will come out of this. I hope that uh, the businesses and organizations across the state will hear what we're hearing from the experts today, and that they'll reconsider some of the restrictions that they have in place right now um, to allow people to come back. I, I so appreciate uh, the announcement this week that the Utah Jazz will be ending uh, their requirements for, uh, for, for vaccination cards or testing um, to, uh, or masks to get into their buildings. Again, leaving that up, that risk assessment up to all of us individually to make. And I would encourage um, other organizations and businesses across the state uh, to make those sim have those similar discussions and make similar announcements. And finally, um, I hope that uh, more than anything else that we can move on from the, the, the deeply uh, divided politicization that we've been facing, um, that we can have an opportunity to come together as, as fellow Utahns, uh, that we can heal some of those divides, that we can show our love for, um, for our, our fellow citizens, and uh, that we can, we can continue to make Utah an incredible place for everyone who lives here. With that, um, we have some time for some questions. I'm sure you have a few. Ben, please. Uh, Governor, at this point, so are you declaring that we're into the endemic phase? Has the state been preparing for? We, we're heading into that, yes. Uh, you know, endemic, I don't love that word either. Um, I, I prefer to use, you know, we're, we're, we're treating this as we do um, every other seasonal respiratory virus. I, I guess, you know, colds are endemic. I guess the flu is endemic. Um, that's a very technical term that I'm not sure m many Utahns process or understand. It also end sounds maybe worse than pandemic. Uh, but, uh, but, but certainly we are moving into this phase. And yes, the, the technical term for that would be an endemic phase. Then at this point, are, are you concerned about spiking in football though? I mean, we declared the end game last year and then we saw a huge surge in cases. Sure. Are we no. just going to repeat this cycle? Well, we, we don't know. And, and that's, the, that's the key to all of this. That's why you move into this phase that we're talking about, um, so, so that you're constantly surveilling. We do anticipate that there will be additional spikes. I, I mean, I think all of the experts believe that that will happen. Um, but, but again, we see those spikes in other places as well. The question with those spikes are, are, are twofold. One, how, how high will the spike be? And we can see that as, as it's happening in other places. And, and two, how, how deadly are those spikes? Um, we saw... Uh, for, for the first time, as predicted, we saw a decoupling uh, with, with Omicron from the, the rate of spread of the virus and uh, the, the deadliness of the virus and the, the, uh, the severe hospitalizations that went with that. So, so those are the things that we have to understand. It's, it's also important to point out that we have a wave of immunity now. Experts have pointed that out, a wave of, of immunity, immunity that we have not had in the past. And, and there are two reasons for that. The first one is we have so many more people vaccinated and so many more people boosted. Um, so that is providing significant immunity. We also have immunity that comes from the virus, and that is real. We probably haven't talked enough about it, uh, but we have immunity that came from the original virus. We have immunity that came from alpha. We have immunity that came from delta. And we have more immunity from Omicron than any other variant of the virus, and probably all of them combined, as it is washed across the, the country. Red states, blue states, doesn't matter. Um, that has come there. So uh, there, there are some um, estimates out there that between uh, natural immunity and and uh, and 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 vaccinations and boosters that probably 90% of us have some sort now, uh, some sort of immunity. Now it wanes over time. We know that. Um, we know that not, not every, uh, every case of natural immunity will protect you against the next variant. But, but again, what are we protecting against? 
what we care about is we, we care about keeping people out of the hospital and keeping people for di from dying. That's what we care the most about. And, uh, and, and in Utah, we've done a phenomenal job of that piece. Uh, we have the third lowest mortality rate in the country, the third lowest amount of deaths from, from this virus anywhere in the country. And I hear people say all the time, well, that's just because you're younger. Certainly that's part of it. But even when you adjust for age, we're like sixth lowest in the country. So, so that, that, that doesn't explain all of it. Um, we have had through Omicron, we have, we have been in the, the, the top 10 lowest hospitalization rates almost the entire time, um, as, as low as five or six through most of this. So, so those, those are good signs for us moving forward. And so, no, we are not spiking the football. Um, and by the way, we're not the only state that's going to be making announcements like this. I, I believe California has already made an announcement like this. Many others are making this. The CDC should be making announcements like this, and we've had those discussions with them. Um, they're, they're very good at kind of skating to where the puck was, um, but we're, um, we're hopeful that at some point they'll, um, they'll, be, they'll, they'll start to, to understand it. And, and I, I, I've said this to their face. I said this in Washington, D.C. a couple weeks ago, um, and, and experts have say, are saying this consistently. Um, they, 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 they were behind the ball when this all started. You remember, we, we, we struggled so much early in this because we were the only nation on earth that didn't have a test. Um, that's, that's, it, the, the CDC has been a disaster through all of this. And, uh, and so we're, we're very hopeful that they can change that culture. Um, South Africa, the UK, we're relying on their data, actionable data in the moment, not a month after we needed the data. And so that's, we're hopeful that at the national level, we can change to that model. But unfortunately, and, and maybe, maybe it is fortunately, um, the states have been the leaders in this space from day one, and we will continue to be. You reference California. I understand when they talk about it in crisis mode, they have business capacity restrictions and mask rules. What's the tangible difference for people here in Utah of ending crisis mode and going to the steady state? Yeah, so, so, so the, the tangible differences are the, are the ones that were talked about here. And that's the, the, the way that we will be acting as a state um, through this next phase. And that is when, when we, we will not have mass testing sites open when there's nobody that needs testing, right? We will do that at home. Um, we will be transitioning to a healthcare model so that, uh, so that when you have an illness, you'll go to the doctor. Um, we'll, we'll see these tests where you're tested for a panel. Um, so you, you'll get one test. And tell you if you have the flu, RSV, or Omicron. Those are, those are the types of tests that we will see start to happen. But, but you're right. We have already start, we started this phase a long time ago, moving into a personal risk model um, and, and having people make those individual choices, whether they want to wear masks, whether they, they, you know, they're getting the vaccines, and hopefully they're getting the vaccines. So we, we've certainly made that transition before some other states. We're still reporting case counts to the CDC data, so we present that differently on our dashboard. That's more of a messaging question. Correct. Yeah. We but but again, there won't be as many tests to report because and, and this the, the testing piece is really interesting. If you go back and look, experts last August started calling for moving away from reporting testing the way we've been reporting testing historically. Um, so we, we do report all of those. Our, our doctors, when, when you go and get tested for the flu five years ago, those were reported. And, and so we, we are, have always been tracking those flu cases, right? Um, and, and so that will continue the way it, it always has. But, but we have been transitioning. How, how many of you in this room have taken a home test? before. Okay. Almost every hand has gone up. How many of you reported that to the state health department or the CDC? None of you reported that. That's why case counts have not been accurate for close to a year now. Um, and they're becoming less accurate all the time. As everyone now has an opportunity, um, the federal government will send you four tests. I, I would encourage you to do that before you get sick. If you want those tests, get them now. Um, go ahead and, and go to the, the website, fill that out. You'll get those four tests. You'll have them for if you do get sick. But that's also very, very different. We don't have home flu tests. Um, you know, we don't have home RSV tests, uh, but, but now we do have these, these home COVID tests. So that, that's always going to make reporting less accurate. Now, fortunately, we are one state that have been use, has been using wastewater surveillance. The CDC has recently announced that they're going to expand that across the country. That is a very helpful way to do it. Uh, but, but the best one that we have seen is people reporting to emergency rooms. Um, and we, because we, we test all of them, we can see what's happening with the flu. Uh, that, that's a really good surveillance model. And that, those are showing up as precursors even to some of the other testing that we're doing. Thank you. Other questions? 
you noted that businesses can still continue to make decisions based on COVID protocols. The legislature is advancing bills that look at potentially stripping that decision-making authority, especially when it comes to proof of vaccination. How do you feel about that bill uh, considering it runs counter to your very public statement. Sure. Well, we, we talked about this yesterday and 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 my answer hasn't changed. I, I still I, I again, as we're moving on to this new phase of, of the, the the pandemic response, as we're moving away from a pandemic response, um, I, I and, and most Utahns, most Americans are ready to be done with with this. Um, I, I, I would love the legislature to be done with this, too. I think one of the ways to signal to Utahns that we are done and moving on uh, is to not be running bills that are divisive and, and be done and moving on as well. And, and, and honestly, again, I, I believe that, uh, that the, as, as I push back on mandates from the federal government, um, that, uh, that, that the market will, will, uh, will adjust. Um, and we're seeing that. Um, again, um, my hope is that by the end of the legislative session, there are no more businesses that are that have these restrictions in place. Um, so there's no need for for this type of bill. That's that's what I would prefer to see. And uh, I think that's again, uh, if you're you're following the science, as we hear so importantly, that is what the science is telling us. Um, that it's okay. These these restrictions, as as I mentioned yesterday, um, if, if people requiring a vaccination to come into their their place or their establishment. Um, that with, with Omicron especially, that had nothing to do with whether you actually had Omicron or not, or were spreading Omicron. So you could be sick, you could have COVID, you could be spreading COVID, and you could show your vaccination card and get in and spread it to everyone in there. So that that doesn't make sense. And uh, I sincerely hope that, that businesses will recognize that and that they'll open that back up. And that's so important for us healing and, uh, and coming back together. Okay. Oh, virtual questions. Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, we have a question from the Deseret News. I'm assuming that's Lisa. Okay, we'll see if we can get her on. Sorry, Lisa, we are having some technical we go with issues. Now we're trying the Salt Lake Tribune. See how, if we can get this to work. I'm sure, these were amazing questions, <laughs> and and I'm I'm sure they wanted to know and report on how great we're doing. Governor, in the meantime, go ahead. You yeah, yeah. remade an announcement several weeks ago saying, "Don't get tested. If you if you have symptoms, just assume you have it." Does that skew what we're seeing now? Well, well it, it does not because we have all of these other surveillance techniques to, to see what's happening. Um, and so, and, and every one of them shows the same thing. And uh, that, that's what, what Nate was mentioning today. But by the way, I didn't say everyone should not get tested. And, and it was very clear about that in his remarks as the director of the Department of Health, that there are certain people that absolutely should get tested. And, and if you are if you are high risk, you should get tested. If you're working with high risk individuals, you should get tested. Obviously, there are still some travel requirements where you should get tested. And so it, it does not skew the data. Um, you, the hospitalizations are dropping. Emergency rooms are uh, visits are dropping. Uh, wastewater um, is the, the indicators in wastewater are dropping everywhere in the state. So that, that is all very good news. And, and in fact, because of what we've been able to show over the uh, the past three weeks, four weeks, then it allows us even more confidence to move into this steady state because we we're, we've shown the rest of the nation and we've had these conversations with other governors and other health officials across the country that we um, that that you can use these other indicators and that they do work and uh, and so there's much more confidence again across the nation uh, that that we can move to this model. Are we able to get? I have a question. We can okay, and they can they can put it in the. Chat, and I'll, I'm happy to answer. Your message for Utahns who are immunocompromised or otherwise 
unable to adequately protect themselves from COVID-19 and depend on others to take precautions like wearing masks? Yeah, so, so here's the thing, and, and it's a false question. It's a false dichotomy. Um, it, it is absolutely false that if you're immunocompromised, you can't protect yourself from COVID-19 and that we have to have every single person in the world um, protect you from COVID-19. That was true a year ago. That is not true today. I have two severely immunocompromised siblings. Um, we have been dealing with immunocompromised situations our entire lives. I have a sister who wears an N95 mask every winter. We were wearing masks before it was cool. Um, it, we were, that, that's, there are steps for all of us to protect ourselves. We have boosters, um, we, have, we have medications now. Um, there are so many new medications. In fact, the, the, uh, the, the FDA and the CDC announced a couple more just, just over the past two weeks. These new medications from, uh, that, that, that will protect people. And they are medications that can be taken ahead of time as a preventative measure. And they are medications that can be taken immediately uh, upon or shortly after testing positive. Uh, and so we have all of those tools. And so I completely reject this false notion that every single person in the world has to wear a mask and has to socially distance for the rest of our lives to, to, uh, to protect people, because it's just not true. We care deeply about our immunocompromised individuals. And that is why if you see someone wearing a mask, if you see someone wearing an N95 mask, don't mock them. Give them your love and support, because it's very possible that they are going through cancer treatments. It's very possible that they live with someone who is severely immunocompromised. That's why we have to be kind and, and we have to be respectful of the choices that people make. Hi, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, I'm sorry, just a second. Um, I was writing my question into the- Yeah, you were prepared for us to hear you, so. <laughs> um, so cases right now, even undercounted as you point out, are still more than three times what they were in July, right before the Delta variant filled up the hospitals, ICU, and the ICUs have been over capacity for like five months at this point. Since that time, only like 16% more people are vaccinated now. And they're not as effective as they were at that point, unless people are getting boosted, which we know they aren't in Utah generally. So actually, lots of people are getting boosted. Well, only twenty-five percent or so of Utahns have gotten yeah. a booster, and we're getting months. And every day is like more time away from when they first got vaccinated. So I guess what in the data makes us think that the same thing won't happen again, like what happened in in August and September, only this time with less warning, since we won't be doing widespread testing. So, so again, you have to follow the science. And I know that's really hard for people because the science has changed, but you have to follow the science. And the science is very clear. We're, we're not making this change today. We're making this change by March 31st, okay? Omicron is the most predictable of every variant we have seen. We know what is happening with Omicron. We don't have to guess, we don't have to pretend. We know what's happening because we can see it. We saw what happened in South Africa. We saw what happened in the UK. We saw what happened in New York. We've seen what, what's happened in every one of these places. And not only that, again, again, this, this go back to October, August of last year where experts, really smart people, People with degrees, much better and, and smarter than me, were saying, stop using case counts. That's not the way to track this virus. We have better ways to do that, and, and we have them, and we're doing it. So we are not giving up. Utah has one of the best surveillance systems in the country. It has been recognized for a long time. We were, we were doing surveillance on these Omicron variants before many other states and at a much higher rate. So we know uh, what the new variants are as they're moving throughout our state. Those will continue. We are still doing enough testing uh, and that testing will continue. It just won't be the state providing that testing. So that testing will continue and it will be reported. Um, and, and so we know where this is going. We know where the trends are. And if it doesn't, we have the ability to adjust. This idea that we have to get stuck in some crazy situation forever is, is very, very unscientific. And, and quite frankly, I'm very disappointed in the media members that continue to perpetuate that um, instead of understanding. We've seen a huge change in the national media. And I don't know if it's just because blue governors are, are sounding like red governors now, uh, but there's certainly been a change. But there have been some media 
some very few in the state of Utah that have refused to see what's happening everywhere else and to understand where that is going. And so that's why we're having this press conference to help convey the importance of how the science has changed on this, how every one of these new tools that we have, um, th there continue to be reports that sound like they're from March of two years ago, um, when, when that is just certainly not the case. And so um, I'm sure that uh, that this story will be covered, um, the, the hopefully, um, with the, the, uh, the advice of the experts that we've been given, following the science as it has happened across the country and across the globe, and that we will get this message out to Utahns that we have the ability now to make those decisions individually, to protect ourselves, and uh, and to uh, live happily ever after. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, that's all the time that we have for questions. We so appreciate you being here. We wish you the very best. Stay safe, and uh, especially during the last two weeks of the session. Take care of yourselves. Thank you. Okay. I'm by the way.